there's not a whole lot to talk about. Um, I did want to give you a little bit of information that's happening in the business office. So I think you'll remember me talking about this last year. We're trying to get payroll set up in the school's database so that we're doing payroll in live time versus using Excel spreadsheets and then going back and booking journal entries. Conway was our trial run last year, and uh, I'm glad we only took on one school at a time. Um, because it did have, we did have some problems with that setup. So we are in the process of finishing Conway, getting set up for payroll, and then we'll work on the other elementary schools. And the idea with that is that you'll be able to see more real-time data, and then we'll also have access to personnel information that I only see in paper file right now. So right now, if a question comes in about someone's hire date or what their salary is, I have to manually go pull a paper file and that's just inefficient. So we pay for the payroll module already because Frontier uses the payroll module because the towns do our payroll. We didn't set it up when we first started with Infinite Visions. And so I'm slowly working on that process. So just wanted to let you know about that. And Modernization, then, that's crazy. Yeah, we're getting there. I'm slowly making progress in the business office. That's awesome. It's hard when you got people who've been in the district for 30 years. They don't like change very yep. much. Yep. Um, but we're working on it. So the other thing we're doing is getting our school lunch activities in our database. Again, currently that's managed in Excel through the food service office. We do balance with the town, so we know what our fund balance is and what we have for money coming in and going out. But again, I'm really looking for that concrete real-time data so that we can get expense reports, reports in a more timely fashion. So a couple of things going on there just to keep you in the loop. Uh, and then our revolving fund update, I'm not going to go through each of our funds. I will take questions, obviously, if you have them, whether it's about the expense reports I sent or about the revolving fund balances. Um, Jared, if you want to ever talk about any of this, Darius, have you guys met, done your meeting yet with new? Maybe I missed it. Did you meet with Jared already? Okay. I must have just missed it. Um, but I'm happy to chat at any point if I know this all may feel foreign, although you have a finance background, so maybe it doesn't. Um, so we are in a good position for what we're projecting going into this year and ending out the year in our school choice fund. We are looking at having more than a year's reserve in our fund at the end of the year. Um, I do think we should talk about in budget season what our expenses are. We are overexpending our revenue slightly. So I think we should look at that and see if there's anything we can move on to general fund so that we're almost matching what we're bringing in and what we're putting out. Um, but we're in a healthy spot, so I'm not concerned about anything there. School lunch uh, has always been, <laughs> you know, from what I understand, a, a point of contention as far as whether or not the program should be making money. Um, but with last year's revenue that came in from free lunches, and then uh, we did have some expenses, but if you recall, we did move salaries and wages over to general fund. We were able to end the year with a much more positive balance than we've had in the past. Uh, we have about 15000 in that count to end the year. Uh, and school lunch is free for all students. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, I'm going to let them out. I will be right back. Mine are responding. <laughs> it's okay, guys. Sorry, one downside of doing this from home. Um, so school lunch and breakfast is free for all of our students, and we are offsetting some of our school lunch expenditures for salaries and wages with that ESSER 3 grant. And if you recall, that was intentional so that we could build up our reserves uh, for this year with any revenue that is brought in and hopefully be able to move those salaries and wages back onto that revolving fund for next year. Uh, early childhood is in a good position. We've got students back in the program bringing in rev regular revenue. Um, same story there that we're using some of that ESSER grant to help offset salaries and wages with the intention of bringing those back onto the revolving fund next year since they had gotten so depleted in the past. But we're, we're projecting healthy balances on all of those. And if anything changes, I'll obviously keep you informed. Um, and then our special education revolving program, I, I mean, I don't have to tell you how um, well this program does. 
and we do bring in a good amount of tuition. We are overexpending our revenue that we're bringing in this year. Um, so we, we, again, should talk about that and see if there's anything that we can move around back to the general fund in the future so that we're not continuing to drive down that balance. Um, this is a fund that historically has been able to carry one year of reserves as the revolving fund balance. So just things to look at. But overall, I think we're in a, in a good position and certainly nothing to be concerned about at this point. But I'm happy to take questions if anyone has them. Any questions? on where we stand at the moment. Exciting to hear we're not starting a negative with school lunch. Yeah, Jeff was very surprised, our food service director, we met today to go over the numbers and he was shocked. You know, he's only in, not even hit a full year yet and came into a little bit of chaos, a lot of chaos to say the least, but it's good to be in a positive spot for sure. That's awesome. It is something we'll have to check. You know, it was brought up in a different school committee meeting that you know we have to watch what the federal government's going to do because if they change next the following year, we're going to be, you know, we're going to start. We're going to. It'll be interesting to see what they do. If they continue moving forward, they may, or they may have to do a different kind of model of how they're doing it moving forward. Because if they just drop it off the way it was before, you're going to see kind of a crash within the school system. So, um, and we've also done we're doing a better job of you know. Um, getting students to sign up for lunches and in the breakfast is almost like a breakfast snack time. So in really pushing those meals out and give the max we can from the federal government on that. Great. Then All righty. That school lunch is free for the remainder of the year? Yes. Breakfast and lunch. And breakfast. Awesome. Um, is that it for finances? Any questions? Try to sign those warrants quickly when you see them. Um, and we're on to dogs barking. Um, I did not see any public comment or public comment is, you know, up in the air right now. But OK, no public comment. Uh, unfinished business, COVID-19 update. So, um, I, you know, I put in my superintendent's report, but just kind of really briefly going through, we did get um, cool testing up and running. Um, and as I said in other meetings, we, we've got it up and running weeks before, unfortunately, fortunately and unfortunately, weeks before many people, many schools in Western Mass were able to, um, you know, the, the, the state system they set up kind of fell flat opening with the opening of school. We were able to get up and running before the districts, and I give it a tribute to Meg Birch, who was on the ball right from the beginning and on them, and maybe squeak wheel got the grease, the first squeaky wheel got the grease. Um, cause we were able to get going two weeks ago where I was talking to some of my colleagues and they were just getting going this week for the first time. Um, and additionally to that, um, it's also a test and stay, which is also many, is it already been very valuable in other, other buildings in our district, allowing students to, um, stay in school, even though they were close contact. Um, so that part is positive. I do want to say thank you to, you know, the school of nurses as well as the, I don't know how Kristen's doing exactly up there, but it takes multiple staff members to get it done. And um, we kind of threw it at them and we said, well, it's just going to make this work. And they picked it up and they ran with it. And so I want to thank them as well. Um, I did have a meeting. Any questions on pool testing or test and stay or anything like that on that? Okay. Um, the, um, I was going to say, the next thing we talked about is I saw the commissioner, I guess it was two weeks ago Friday, not last Friday, Friday before, um, he actually came out to Western Mass and we had a conversation, not him and I, but him and my um, superintendent buddies. Um, and we talked a little about, you know, what's going to happen October 1. As you know, he put that mask mandate in statewide. Um, he basically said, and I was very you know, direct with him and saying, like, so is it going to go back to the, you know, local, you know, battles that we had that kind of divided our community all over again once the state withdraws? Um, and he basically said, you know, Basically, you know, as we withdraw, as we remove, whether or not what he's going to do in October is either he's going to extend it, maybe another month, given the numbers right now, like that's where I think he should go, but we'll see what happens. Um, and then he's also talking about um, bringing back a, you know, some sort of mandate that you can remove masks if a certain percent of your population is vaccinated, cool testing, and doing. Um, and what's the counts in your county or town. So they haven't explained exactly what that's going to look like, but, you know, he's going to be trying to um, do something like that to, I don't know how that would work in elementary schools since the majority of kids aren't vaccinated. So we'll see what the desk comes. 
But I asked, you know, about, you know, are we going to have that battle locally? And he said, basically, you're going to have that battle locally. He said, what's going to happen is, he said, as we, we put all these mandates in place, he actually had a good answer. Um, I was kind of rude in my question to him because I was irritated, but um, he, he had a good answer in the sense that, you know, we put in all these mandates, it's hard then to take them away. You know what I mean? It's hard to, you know, as we, you know, it's going to come down to local decisions on that um, because it does, the state has their power and then it comes down to local decisions. So whether or not it's October, November, December, at some point it's coming back to the school committee. Right now, as you know, the Board of Health has made a decision. That, so right now, if the state removes something, the Board of Health um, still stands, their mask mandate still stands. If the Board of Health removes it, then you currently have a school committee mandate that would have to be retracted. So if anything happens the first week of October with the decree from the commissioner or, you know, whatever, I call it a decree, that's my word. But um, if he makes you know, a change statewide, it's not going to affect us immediately. The then local board of health would have to make a change, and then we would have to have a meeting to make a change. So there's a series of things that has to happen. So I just wanted you to kind of know how the how the playground's working on that. Maybe he'll delay it now that there's a vaccine down to five until that gets up and running, and they'll they'll take the decision until that can happen. Would be nice. Yeah, I think early on, some of the politics that were being played is that they were trying to motivate, especially more urban communities. Remember, Eastern Mass runs policy in the state of Massachusetts. Western Mass is really, we're not big players. Just, we don't have the population of students that are affected. You know, I mean, you got to remember that they have districts larger than our county. You know what I mean? Um, by a long shot, you know, there's only 9,000 students in our county. And there's, you know, there's several districts that have more than 9,000 students. Um, so they're talking about, they're trying to motivate, talk about allowing people to be not be masked if they get a certain vaccine percentage to increase the vaccines in the communities. And so I think there's all these different kind of politics at play. And then obviously that backfired as the state kind of pushed back and the school committees pushed back. And, you know, a lot like where when we close schools in the open weeks of this kind of thing, where you know the state was going one direction, they also pivoted because the local people started making decisions that made them, I would say, look bad. Um, so we'll see what happens, but that's there's a lot of politics that don't reflect Western Mass politics happening there. Any questions COVID-wise? I'm sure it'll be a fun ride. I can't imagine it'll be as as much as next last year, I hope. You know, in in Kristen, how's COVID been in the, you know, just as part of your, within the buildings, I, you know, each kind of principal just jumped in. I, I think kids don't recognize masks the way adults do. They kind of, it's, a, it's an annoyance, but we really did a lot of changes to how we run schools, although uh, Conway has a lot of classes still happening outside, but kids are inside more, group work, that kind of stuff. Kristen, do you want to expand on that at all? Yeah, well, you know, this summer, um, Conway didn't have a mask mandate during our summer program. And um, and then we did after because of, you know, what came down. But when we met as an instructional leadership team, which includes most of the classroom teachers, we did a list of things we wanted to stay. We might want to keep from last year, you know, some good different practices that we that we took on during COVID and things that we wanted to leave behind from last year. And remember, we were planning this thinking we weren't wearing masks. So. Um, one of the things that the uh, staff really wanted to keep in place was our, and this wasn't COVID driven. It was really driven because we really felt that there were so many benefits to outside learning. And, um, you know, the, the younger grades certainly do a little more outside than the older grades, but it was one thing that we really wanted to keep. And so when the mask mandate came down, um, we were just already set up for wanting to keep outside learning. So we are out, you know, the, the younger kids in particular, third grade and down, the older kids, you know, they have a little bit more lecture kind of PowerPoint kind of things, but they're outside a lot, you know, much of the day, which is great. The kids masking inside, they're, they're you know, just true champions. Um, the summer when we didn't have kids masks, it was it, that was really nice too, you know. Um, but obviously we went back to masking, but the kids don't complain, you know. So at, often at recess, I have to say, remember you can take your mask off at recess. They they just sort of go with the flow, um, and so it, it's been going really well. But we we really do enjoy the outside time with the kids. 
um, you know, it's a great, great learning environment for the kids for many of the things that we do. That's awesome. Yeah. Any questions about COVID related issues? All righty. Thank you, everybody. We are on to um, anti-racism. Sounds like you thought what you were doing and now you're not doing that. According to your report, right? Oh, oh, you saw that. Yeah. So you saw my updated report. So yeah, we, we were going a direction. We hired a consultant. We were all excited to set up the basically the opening meeting was supposed to be next week. And I received word yesterday that the consultant is this consultant is a group of uh, people. Um, and they are unable due to the they believe their plate was too full to feed meet our needs and had backed out. So which is disappointing because you know, we kind of have everything lined up. We've already started the school year, so we've lost a little momentum there. You know, professional development's already still occurring. We, we have a plan. The idea was I wanted to create a consultant to have a, another lens on what we're doing, kind of the stamp, I not just say stamp of group, but working with us to, to make sure that we're doing what, you know, we should be doing because a lot of the stuff we created was in-house, um, you know, with outside professional development. So, um, you know, right now we're looking for somebody else to, somebody or a group to, to come in and, be a consultant for us um, to look at um, uh, racism and equity in our schools, uh, but also looking at we've already got the trains already running for this year on the track. So I want someone to look work up with was what we're doing, get our community involved in what we're doing, and then planning for next year. Um, we've already had you know conversations that we do need to do an equity audit, and that would be something we would look at next year. It's not something we want to do in the middle of our work. We want to get some of our work done, and then and then do an audit because you do an audit in the beginning. Yeah, you're going to find a ton of deficits. But let's do it after we start getting the work going, and then we can kind of adjust our track. So that's you know hot off the press. I actually haven't even announced that to the um, equity committee yet because um, it came in yesterday, and Sarah and I were kind of immediately reaching out trying to find other solutions um, that we can you know, other consultants that we might be able to interview and that kind of stuff. So, um, so is this different than the people that reported to us last year? Yes. So the, um, that consulting group was working with the secondary. Um, okay. It's a group of people. Um, and um, the consultant we had working with us, Amanda is taking a full-time job um, in a private school. And so, you know, we're, okay. and it, we're you know, entering kind of a different chapter as well. So, kind of adjusting two things at once. So we were kind of, ex we knew them. This is not something they normally did, but it was like, you know what? You see what right. we're doing. We know you, and then, you know, you can, you know, maybe you can fill this role. So, you know, it's a unique thing because a lot of the program, a lot of consultants and stuff out there have a full business. They have a business model. They have a plan. This is what we're going to put your school through. We kind of created our own plan as a community, which is very good. Right. We want someone to come in and say, yeah, it's good. This is, you need to adjust us, adjust. And, you know, this is how we move forward. I don't want, to just say, scrap everything we've done and say, hey, here's a, you know, a cookie cutter, you know, anti-racism, you know, equity planning, you know, that kind of stuff. And some of them are very good, but that's not where we are right now. So, yeah. Michael? Yeah, I was, we're connected to the collaborative in Northampton. I was wondering if they, um, if they would be a resource that we would be interested in. They, they are a resource and we've used them for professional development and we've used them um, to help us guide us in that work. Um, we could go that route. We are looking for something um, just a little different, um, kind of a, a, a different, we've used them and they have their lens. I was looking for something fresh and unique, so to speak. Um, it, we may well end up going, I want to say back to them, but they were one, they are one of the options. Alrighty, I'm sure you'll keep us posted. And the revised non-union personnel handbook. We looked at this last year, is that right? We did, and Phil is not here because I think Phil was the one that, the primary person that wanted to get information from the towns because um, there was concern about the school benefits being different than the town benefits. And this was primarily in regard to the increase and the longevity bonus for non-union personnel. Um, I know that I did share the handbook and the changes, uh, the summary of changes with Jan Warner and, um, oh gosh, Ross Perry, who was before Veronique, yep. uh, but I never heard anything else about it. Okay. So, so we want to table it? About, but. 
we want to table it for now? I think that makes most sense. Um, right now, uh, employees that are eligible for longevity benefit are getting the amount that they would have received based on the previous policy. <clears throat> and if it is eventually approved, we'll retroactively pay them back if that okay. if it goes that way. So makes sense. Jared, did you get that? I see, sorry to call you out right when you're speaking to somebody else. Uh, did, did you get that handbook? No, probably you know, not. Shelly, if you could forward it to them, that'd be great. Yeah, I will. Okay. And I will follow up with the town as well. I'm not even sure if Veronique knows about it because it was before she started. So it might be something that her and I need to have a conversation about too. All righty. Um, on to new business. And Michael, you know you have to take over at 745, right? Yep. Okay. So on to new business. Summer building maintenance update. I'm sure that's you, Kristen. Yes. Yes. Sorry, go between the. Uh, so um, I'm sure Darius will go over the HVAC report, which was very good. We have three rooms have new floors. You have to come by and see them. They're beautiful. Um, the library is looks brand new. Yeah, you'll have to stop by for all of this. We have a new carpet. Bruce and Jeannie painted the entire um, the entire library. Brought it up to, <laughs> to current state. We had some renovations. The walls in the computer lab were very high. They were sort of higher than the students. And so students can sit on either side, which made it very difficult to teach. So the not walls were knocked down to, or brought down to waist level, which was great. Four classrooms received mini split air conditioning units, which the staff wants to thank you for over and over again. That's awesome. And, uh, yeah, so we're hoping, you know, we can get the other rooms air conditioned um, as well. And then the playground project was just completed, including the um, sidewalk pavement um, around the playground. So a lot of great things happening at Conway Grammar School in terms of building um, projects and maintenance this year. Really great. We're very excited for the new changes. Some of those things were a long time in coming. That's awesome. Yeah, very excited. Elaine, I noticed there's two votes in the new business section. Do you want to be here for those? She's like, no. You have enough. <laughs> okay. Just wanted to double check. All right. I will sign off. Leave it in your hands. Well, Thanks, everybody. Jay, Elaine, that means you might get, are you going to the um, conference? Yes. Can we vote you as a delegate then? Yes. Okay. You can. Yep. Thank you. All right. Thanks. Thanks, everybody. Michael, do you want me to go right into summer program update? Uh, yeah, that would be great. So next, next on new business is summer program update. Okay. So what? Um, I don't think anyone was out at the time. The first year that I was here, that I was principal of Conway, um, all of the uh, reading and math programs, sort of the summer camps were done at Deerfield Elementary School. And um, I remember being a little disappointed that there were only three students from Conway who attended the program. And again, being new in the summer, um, I just thought that, you know, there probably should be more children, not knowing all the children, but more children um, in the program. And so when you live in Conway, it's really hard to find childcare when you're working and people to pick up your kids and things like that. So I think that affected a lot of people. The Deerfield program was a wonderful, was a wonderful program and continues to be a wonderful program. But I think it layer adds an extra layer of, um, you know, trouble for parents to get their kids picked up. So after my first year, I came to the school committee and we asked, there was a group of us that came, we had a proposal to have a summer program at Conway Grammar School. Well, um, that first year, the first couple of years that we did it, we had 38 to 42 students in the summer program, which was really, really great. This past year, we we reduced the numbers significantly just because of COVID and and all of the protocols. And um, we had approximately 28 students in the program. The program has been a huge, hugely successful. Um, we never struggle with staff. Most of the classroom teachers want to work in the summer program. 
most of the instructional assistants want to work in the summer program because they see how, what a difference it makes for the children for when they come back to school. They don't, we don't see that summer slide, that four weeks of reading and writing and math, which is, which is sort of um, molded into studies of ants and, and insects and you know, nature. They don't even realize they're doing that. It's made such a difference um, in terms of not having that drastic summer slide. So yet again, um, we thank you for allowing us to have that summer program and, and we hope to continue it because um, typically we service 38 or so kids this past year it was 28 and um, it, it definitely made a difference. We're, we're doing our assessing now, um, you know, so that we can plan interventions and things for students and we, we always pull apart our summer students to see how that worked and, and, and it's the data shows that the slide is definitely not as big when they're in the summer program. So um, we had a great summer and the, and the children really enjoy it. They love coming Monday through Thursday, 8.30 to 12. Um, and we love having them. So again, thank you for that. Kristen, is that also offered to sixth graders who are graduating and moving on? No, unfortunately <laughs> we have a lot of requests, but they have the, um, they have the program at the middle school. It's called, oh, why it's at the What is it? Jumpstart. jumpstart. They have, their, they uh, have a jumpstart program. So okay, that's where the sixth graders go. I know we'd like to keep them as long as we could. Well, thank you, Kristen. Um, any other questions about the summer programs? All right, moving on to personnel update. You kind of got that with the intros. Okay. Oh, I might have. There were anybody not there, Kristen? Any other on that? I I missed that beginning part, right? Oh, that's right. You weren't here. Sorry, Michael. Sorry, okay. Michael. I had um, we had our uh new staff members on Amy Coleman, our new fourth grade teacher, Chris Williams, our new PE teacher, and Julie Woodbury, our new school psychologist. Excellent. Well, I've I've had a chance to uh. Talk to or email Chris Williams already. So I've started to meet a few. So this is great. Oh, good. Good, Michael. Good. Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, next is the memorandum of understanding, uh, DESI DCF discussion only. Yeah. So the discussion only has turned into a vote as school committee meetings have passed. Um, but we are looking for your support and approval and your vote to bring this MOU to the select board for signature because the MOU will actually be between the um, three government offices, Executive Office of Health and Human Services, DESE and DCF and the town. Um, but we did meet with town administrators and sort of the consensus was, sure, we'll be happy to bring it to select board. It'd be great if school committee backed it since it's technically an, an educational component. Um, but basically what the MOU says is that we will abide by any reporting requirements to submit for transportation reimbursement for any student that is considered to be in foster care. Um, we're required to provide transportation to students in foster care under the Every Student Succeeds Act. Um, it's not something that comes up frequently in Conway, so it may never even be needed. But in the event that it does come up, we file the report. If we have this MOU completed, without the MOU, we can't even submit for reimbursement. Um, but if it did come up, we submit for reimbursement. And if the state has funding for it, it's usually between 70, 75 percent reimbursement that we could get back. Um, it fluctuates year to year. It's not a budget line that we put in for because it really doesn't come up a lot in our small districts. Um, but I don't, Darius and I don't think there's any harm in having this in place. So again, we're looking for your support to bring this to, to the select board to ask them for their signature. Did I miss anything, Darius? Darius, did you have a question? No. Nope. Um, okay, so uh, is there a motion to uh, accept the MOU regarding DESI DCF and uh, the transportation of students in foster care? I'll make a motion. 
And a second. I will second. Thank you. Um, so we'll do a roll call vote. Uh, Denise Storm. Yes. Jared Campbell. Yes. And Michael Merritt. Yes. So that is MOU is accepted. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, next is the revised policy BEDH regarding public comments at school committee meetings. Yep, so basically you have before you a, um, when we changed our public comment policy when we went to uh, virtual, we changed language around um, the submission of written comments and that we would read them at the meeting. And we didn't, it, the idea was, you know, it was COVID crisis, how do we continue to have public participation in meetings and that kind of thing. What we didn't think about was, um, or maybe we did, but I didn't think about, and then it came up at the last meeting um, in, in our, so our attorney kind of weighed in, he says, you shouldn't be reading other people's public comments at meetings. Um, and for multiple reasons, first one being that in the video world, if you're reading someone else's public comments, they could be misunderstood as yours. Um, if you're reading or if I'm reading it, that kind of thing. And so, uh, maybe an opinion that you disagree with or is disagreeable by members of the community. Um, the next one is that um, should you be reading something and you find it in either violation of the policy or you are strongly disagreeing with it or you and then you end up um, editing or censoring someone's public comment, then you're going to be in trouble for um, a, a violation within there. Um, and then um, the final one is that, you know, people, you know, the public has the, the opportunity to write you up with their thoughts and opinions on everything. Um, it doesn't need to be read again into public comment. You know, your time, this is a business meeting and sometimes we have so much fun, we forget that. Um, but this is a business meeting and then, you know, you could have, um, you know, you read all those comments they sent you and then to read them again out loud to formulate debate when that's not your, what it's supposed to be about. It's supposed to be taking information and in to help you make decisions on topics and that kind of thing. Um, so, you know, the the, uh, the attorney said that you really should change that. It's the, the old policy said that you would accept written comments longer than three minutes to be put into the public record. It never says that you will read them into the public record. And so some part of me, I was confused on that. I'm like, we've been doing this for years, but we really haven't. Um, and then we really haven't had the kind of tension we've had since COVID um, around policies in, in public comment, especially in Conway, I think the first two years we had about three public comments in, in its entirety. You know, so, um, you know, it's changing. Again, we create policy for if and when issues come up, not um, because they're happening every year. Um, the the, the uh, chair can make exceptions if there's some reason where someone you know, is unable to speak or, you know, that kind of thing. Um, you know, we can there's, there's leeway in there for the chair to make an exception to something, um, you know, especially, you know, you start thinking like, well, someone raised a thank you note. And you know, the chair could say, you know, we got one public comment tonight. It's, a, it's whatever. It can be read. And you can work around different kind of things. But it is, um, you know, and people can still read their own public comment if they want, you know, into a record. Or have, they can, someone else can come on to read somebody else's public comment. It's just as long as it's not someone from the member or a school uh, member of the staff. <clears throat> Thank you, Darius. I think that, so I don't know if you want to talk about that part and then have additional add-on to that. Oh, just I was going to say, quick, um, prior to remote meetings, you know, it, were there written comments before, or just not? It was not an issue. Or it, my memory is that we didn't receive written comments to read into the public record. Um, we did from time to time receive notes that a school member wanted to read. Usually it was not, um, if someone read it word for word, it was usually a thank you note. Sometimes members would say, I received an email from, you know, so what happens is for the public that's watching is that the school member receives an email that says, I'm very upset with how loud the swing squeaks during recess. And we really need to address that. And so, the school member, you know, receives an email and says, and brings it up at a meeting, says, you know, I did receive, you know, you know, I will bring it up at a public meeting. And then, you know, sometimes you can, you can just receive a thing and talk about it at a meeting, but reading word for word into public comment, it didn't happen very often. 
if it did, it was usually I want to thank, you know, the school committee for going above and beyond, you know, for the playground this year. Yeah. Yeah, something like that. And so this proposal would now the written comments would enter the record but not be read, right? Is that right. And if if they if they submit it as comments to you, you could, you know, um, everything that you do is public record. So, but it could be entered if they want it to be submitted as part of the minutes of the meeting, they can do that. Okay, but if someone, if I was to write to you, Jared, and say, listen, I've said about the squeaky swings, I should fix something that's easier to say. Um, you know, if I write that to you as a complaint, that's not a that's not something that's going into the public record of the meeting. However, if I said, you know what, um, I'm going to give you a long, you know, a long, usually it's a longer piece about how you know, swing noise is dangerous to, you know, young children. And I want you to, um, this to be part of the debate, you know, the public record debate. So, okay. and usually it's sent to all school members at that point. Not usually it is. Oh, thank you. The other thing that other committee members brought up. So, you know, at, our, at that last meeting, um, um, you know, we did have, you know, public comment that, that um, was offensive to members of our community. And um, while it was addressed in the meeting, there was you know, some um, comments from the community that you know, the school community needs to do more to keep members of the community safe when they give their opinions at public comment and those who are hearing the public comment. So one of the things they asked me, to, the other committee on um, the first meeting asked me to create a list of, if we ever do have public comment where we feel there's going to be, um, you know, Quite a bit of it, or you know, you know, controversial subjects that that we review what the rules are, and they create a rules for public comment to remind people that there is a policy that you know things like you know things are should, should be addressed to the chair, not to individual members. That it has to be a topic relevant to the school committee on the agenda or relevant to the powers of the school committee. Can't attack school committee, can't attack school committee members or um, you know members, staff members, and that kind of stuff. So there's these general rules. So I've already started to create that. Um, so I'll present that to you at the next meeting. Um, but also included in there is what does the school committee do if our own rules are being broken and the chair is unaware? Um, and I say that unaware because, you know, because many of you were at that last meeting, um, it's very difficult when there's 250 people on a call talking about a very emotionally driven subject to hear every word and to hear it from other perspectives and, and that kind of stuff, and then to take action on that. And what do we do if we hear that? And so. Um, I added that what you should do is you know, basically you ask the chair for a point of order because a rule has been broken that's a policy. And then you see, you say, in this particular case, Mr. Chair, you know, I believe that Ms. Gordon is out of order here in her remarks to the superintendent. Um, and, you know, we need to make sure that that, that, that ceases. So uh, there's, a, there's a way to interrupt there. You're talking to not the person making the comment, but the person running the meeting to remind them because it does get difficult and we're in this business together. You know, we need to support the chair and that kind of stuff. And maybe, you know what, I've been doing this, you know, in this district for 14 years. It hasn't been, you know, a problem where the chair was going to need, but it, it, it came up. And so now we create, remind ourselves, how do we address those kind of things? Um, and the same thing goes for anything. Like, you know, within a meeting, you know, our members need to feel like, God, I feel like this isn't going right. Or that person's you know, was reading their thing and they've gone on for seven minutes. We said three minutes and, you know, the chair's not dinging the bell, so to speak. Maybe, we, you know, we got to, it's not fair to other members who we cut short. You know, so we got to, it allows us also to make sure there's equity for everyone because we're all gatekeepers of that. So I'll add that to the rules as well. Darius, I wasn't at that meeting. At the beginning of the meeting, were there any kind of like ground rules laid out or or no? The, the meeting was extremely complicated. It, it, was, it, was, a, it was extremely complicated because it was a very controversial subjects, masks in schools. Um, and what happened was we had what, 27 people wanting to be, have their thing read, I think. And then even more, not even, I, mean, I forget the, it was 27 entirety. Anyways, there's a lot of people speaking and it was run by the board of health, but they handed over public comment to the chair of unit 38 who didn't have the ability to mute people or, or any of that kind of stuff. And, so things were, you know, people, you know, there was people calling out, this is unfair. Someone yelled, uh, I don't know, profanity at one point. You know, I mean, there was other things other than um, the, in the remarks regarding, um, 
you know, slavery um, that was, you know, offensive. So, um, so there was other things going on. So it was kind of like it was building up. And so that's what I mean. There's a lot of things kind of like, and it wasn't really the meeting. It was a very large meeting and it was, you know, a chair, you know, and so it was, I think an hour and 40 minutes into it where it got to the point where that took place too. So, I mean, there's a lot of things going through. So excuses, reasons, also school committee members didn't know how to react, who did want to react. And also it wasn't really a small meeting like this. You have, you feel like you have a lot more vocal power. Also, we put a thousand boxes or 200 boxes on the screen. And all of a sudden it's like, do I say something here? Do I interrupt? Can I interrupt? How do I interrupt? We never really talked about that before. So that's kind of, in its entirety, it was it was not an easy situation, and it wasn't as clear as. Well, just to be fair, it wasn't as clear as DA on some. I mean, the apparent profanities, but when you're listening, you're trying to figure out what really does it mean that I don't, you know. And then you think about it afterwards, you're like, wow, that's offensive. You know, it was one of those kind of things. It was, you know, depending on where your background was and that kind of thing. So, well, I appreciate the work you're doing on helping define the guidelines for our community and. And how the how the right I lo I love this like uh, the ability to say point of order and that that helps the chair do what they need to do. It's like supports the chair. So I appreciate that. Okay. All right. So if you want to vote this tonight, which would be good, you want you have to waive your two readings to alter a policy. So you have to you have to acknowledge that you have a two reading policy. Mm -hmm. I'm saying I'm explaining this very carefully because it's Jared's yeah. perspective. So basically, we have a policy. Normally, Jared, what you do is any policy changes, you get a reading, and then the next meeting you vote, so you have time to think about it. But when, at times, it's going to where your policy needs to happen faster because this will affect the next meeting, which may be a joint meeting. Um, so you want to have the same policies. Um, you can waive the two reading, but you have to acknowledge that you're waiving your own policy, and you have to vote that first. So you want to do a, if you want to vote this, someone has to vote to waive the policy. Yep. Roll call vote that, then you roll call vote the um, the new policy. Sounds good. The acceptance of the policy. So then, and then I make a motion that we waive the two vote policy. Is that right? Reading, yep. Okay. Reading, yep. Um, I will second that motion. And I'll do the roll call vote. Uh, Denise Storm? Yes. Jared Campbell? Yes. And Michael Merritt, yes. And then, uh, so that leaves us with the vote for the, sorry, I'm scrolling through the agenda here. Um, for the revised policy BDH for public comment at school committee meetings, uh, do I have a motion to make the revisions and accept the revised policy? I'll make a motion to accept the revised policy. And a second. A second. Uh, roll call vote. Denise Storm? Yes. Jared Campbell? Yes. And Michael Merritt? Yes. All right. Uh, one last new business uh, thing to do. Uh, the MASC MASS Joint Conference is going to be held, uh, what is that, like six weeks from now, roughly? It's coming up quick. Um, and we need to have a designation of official of an official delegate. Um, I think if I read it correctly, there's also an alternate delegate that we would uh, elect. Um, and I'm I'm unable to attend the conference. Do we know who else is planning to go? Is this in person or online? Um, or they, both. They're it's a hybrid, offering, both. Yeah, they're mm -hmm. offering either way. Um, we got an invitation over the summer uh, to ask if we wanted to attend, uh, and then we had to indicate if we were going to be attending or not. Um, as far as I know, no one from Conway has signed up, and I only know that from a financial standpoint that there's nothing been put in for purchase order for it yet. Elaine said on her way out that she was going, though, didn't she? She did. So, um, so she, she likes to go, so she's been in the past, so she knows what she's signing up for. Yeah. All right, well. Um, did you, Michael, did you say we need to have um, more than one person? I don't, I don't think we have to have an alternate. Um, 
But the official delegate form says uh, for the school committee of uh, Conway, uh, the official voting delegate is, and we need to nominate. And then they have a place for an alternate voting delegate. Um, but if we only have one member attending, uh, we just wouldn't have an alternate. So. Um, so I would. What's that? Not, I wouldn't worry about the alternate. This is not you're not passing legislation that's going to change the face right. of America. Right. You know I mean, I, it's just it's just they do some you know there's a lot of business stuff that's interesting. Though. Well, it's very important to them. It's good to have someone there, and you're okay. If only one person can go, and they we're sending five delegates from each committee, so right. you know from from our district, so to speak. So we actually get more votes than most other districts. This one time we win, you know. So right. um, so if Elaine's going to go. You know, sometimes people are del the de delegate; they don't attend the meeting. You'll never know, right? You know, so okay. I'll make a nomination for uh, school committee of Conway that the official voting delegate is Elaine Campbell. Is there a second? Second. Thank you. Uh, roll call votes. Denise Storm. Yes. Jared Campbell. Yes. Michael Merritt. Yes. Thank you. Um, and so we're on to reports. Uh, I don't think the chair has a report at this time. Um, is there a report from the collaborative? We haven't met recently. We're meeting next week. Okay. And um, Kristen, do you have other pieces of your report you'd like to do? I only have one thing. I gave my report throughout it, but I only have one thing. And this is the best thing ever. Front page, just this in from a couple of staff members, front page of the... Oh, for the <laughs> How's my brother? This, is, fan this is fantastic. Literally front page, or are you joking? No, well, oh, I don't. Oh, now that you say that, it's uh, I, I don't know. They sent this to me, and it says, you know, that now, is frameable. I got a look. Is not in this the is paper. out as of right now. This I got this five minutes ago from several staff members. This is the best ever. I, I love my hat on. Some of those dares. Someone might take your picture. It's like, oh, there's plenty of kids are yeah. taking pictures of. Conway oh, Grammar cool. School. Isn't that awesome? So check out uh, the Greenfield Recorder for our fabulous superintendent. Well, I agree. That's, that's minus on your evaluation, by the way. <laughs> you had the best time. So you finally had a great time. It's been a tough couple years. If you haven't been to the playground, though, that stuff is fun to run around on, especially if you got old knees. More like a basketball court made out of that stuff. That's going to be awesome. And then uh, the superintendent report, Darius, any other? The other thing that's on my report that we didn't talk about, which is not affecting Conway at this time, is that there is a bus driver shortage and, um, you know, it's affecting Deerfield right now where they've combined routes. They're able to do that there. Um, you know, it's creating some longer runs, but not as long as it would have created if they doubled up Conway runs. Um, you know, due to there's just a trans, there's a shortage of, of um, drivers. If I've seen that in the paper, some great funny stories out there what they're using, what schools are doing for drivers as well. Um, but you know, we're we're you know we've made, weathered the storm well. Group Go Transportation's weathered the storm well. There are other districts who don't know what to do, and they're um, you know frantically trying to figure out how to handle those kind of things. Um, on the thing was also was the HVAC. You know, we will talk about that. We talk about capital improvement. I want us to look at, you know, HVAC in the entire building. Um, I think, you know, we have the probably the capacity to do that either over one or two or three years. But we'll talk about that. Um, as the heat's kind of left us, we've kind of forgotten about it. But it's not just the heat. It's the, uh, you know, the condensation in the building and mildew and mold and those kind of things to creating healthy buildings. And we've seen some schools and some um, places of, uh, 
you know, public buildings have been shut down due to the fact that they haven't been able to control their moisture in their building. And so when we talk about air conditioning, and I'm trying to make sure that you're talking the same kind of language as we talked to, you know, some people like, well, when I was a kid, you know, we ran the stove through July, you know, that kind of stuff. And so, you know, there's no need for AC in schools, but it's more about keeping buildings healthy. It also can be a cooling center. And we're getting more and more hot days and higher levels of humidity. I don't know if it's actually higher levels. I don't have any data on that. But we definitely feel like we're getting a lot more hot days um, and more, you know, we're servicing more students in the summer more than ever. Um, and that is definitely a change than what happened 5, 10, 15, 20 years ago. Um, schools are open year round. So um, we'll talk about how we can do that. We, you know, Conway's already ahead of most of the other buildings. Um, you guys have done a great job keeping that building, um, you know, funding those repairs and stuff as we go. But we'll talk about more about that later on. That's all I got. All right. Thank you. Um, Unless we have executive session business, uh, I think we've finished the agenda items. Um, so I guess I would entertain a motion to uh, conclude the meeting. I motion that. All right, and a second. Did you say you'll second? Or I'll second. <laughs> Go for it, Judge. You second. Um, Great. Uh, roll call vote. Denise Storm. Yes. Jared Campbell. Yes. And Michael Merritt. Yes. Thank you, everybody, for an excellent meeting and all the all the great work you're doing. I appreciate it.